there's a story of one of the senior disciples of the Dalai Lama after the invasion of Tibet being detained by the Chinese and he was imprisoned for 18 years, uh, tortured, and finally released. And they interviewed him after this and the interviewer asked, were you ever afraid? And the disciple said, the Lama said, I was afraid at one point that I would lose compassion for my captors, that I would stop feeling compassion for the jailers. But he didn't. And I came back to the US in 2020, arriving literally on November 4th, election day. And I found people's hearts quite dark and darkened. Before I came back, I talked to a teacher named Ajahn Siri Panyo. And he'd said, look, you can go back and you can watch the news but only if you determine not to let it bring up a single unwholesome mind state. And then he said, remember, America is just, it's just a convention. It's just a convention. A few days before that, I'd been giving a foot massage to Longpur Sumedho, and he said, yes, Sankaras, they go up and they go down. Ha, ha, ha. Like Longpur Sumedho laughs. And I think this is important uh, going into 2024 because we have an idea of duty around staying informed and being attuned to the news and the election cycle and doing good. And all that is important to a point. We can and should, as Buddhists, and as members of society, contribute where it's wholesome and necessary. But as practitioners, we've stepped into another realm of duty as well. The teachings that have come down to us that we've encountered have been carried through the rise and fall of civilizations the Buddhist monastic order is the oldest continuous human institution in the world, except for the Jains who beat us by a few years. And this thread of teaching has been passed down generation through generation, a quiet thread of monks and nuns and laymen and laywomen quietly practicing and cleansing their heart. And I don't think we have a clear picture of what the world would look like without that quiet thread running through the cloth of everything that's happened since. There's stories in uh, a book called, I think, A Thousand Miles Without a Cloud of the Maoist guard beating monks and nuns in China in order to take the property of the Sangha for government use and trying to force them to disrobe and those monks and nuns would just say the Buddha's name. And we come into the practice from the West and maybe we've read a book about Buddhism or stumbled across a group, maybe it's Insight Timer and it seems like an interesting thing and we don't realize that the gem that's been given us has been handed down through prisons and through the fall of kingdoms, through immense hardship. And we've been given this gem and it's not an accessory. The chance to cleanse our heart and give that clarity and love to a world that is so in need of it is not just 
a gift, a helpful practice we can take on a few minutes a day in the mornings when we meditate. It is a duty. We have been given a teaching profound in its depth and I think difficult to conceive of in its import and the ripples it can have on those around us. The world is desperately in need of people who are able to put down the drives of selfishness and delusion and greed and hatred and be refuges and calm, centered spaces and hearts. So this is another duty, and it's one that when we walk into an election year and a life in general, we have to hold in balance with the uh, impetus to check the iPhone uh, 20, 10 or 20 times a day uh, for the next news cycle to become entangled. Because there's a real responsibility as practitioners to protect the heart. And this term, to stay informed, is often quite unexamined. Um, how many times does one have to check the news cycle? And when does that become entertainment? And I'd say that, you know, for m many of us, if the Hegel said that evil lies in the gaze that sees evil all around it, and this term yoni so manasikara in Buddhism, meaning appropriate attention, is one of the uh, basic factors in practice where we steer attention, and that that colors the mind and the heart. And so to notice and care for where we turn our gaze and to see how it affects our minds to take in certain sorts of news or uh, become involved in certain kinds of debate. So to really care for ourselves in this, and in some sense, we, when we begin to practice, it's as if we've torn off a scab um, over the heart, and for a time, the mind can be quite raw and vulnerable, and it's okay to pull back for a time from the news cycle. It's okay to pull back from these things until we can re-enter and maintain a centered heart. And it's very interesting, often people find that if they do pull back from imbibing certain sorts of news or all these things, you know, and maybe read one long form article a, a week or uh, just stay up to date through their friends, you get enough information to do the things that you need to do to check the right uh, box on the ballot. But to make no mistake that there's a higher order narrative which we step into and touch when we begin to really move into this spiritual uh, realm and path in life. The Sangha is, uh, of monks and nuns are supposed to stay away from politics because whether someone's Republican or Democrat, um, they deserve the Dhamma. And we have to acknowledge, I mean, this is why I don't speak about Trump and Biden. And people can connect dots and people have enough of that stimulus coming in often. But to have some place in society where we can come together and just be human together, just be practitioners of shared humanity is so valuable. And the US has such an institution and her name is Dolly Parton. It's one of the few places where you can go and find truckers next to drag queens all together. And Dolly Parton has kept her politics a carefully guarded secret. No one knows, no one knows. And what a gift to have some segment of society like that. Now, it's not that as Buddhists, one can't uh, put up, you know, the yard sign or this or that. Uh, not everyone here is a monk. And by that, I mean, no one except for me is a monk. <laughs> but, but, but now there is something where you might be someone's Dharma door. You might be uh, 
the one place where someone actually has a chance to contact these teachings, which save, you know, in many, I think many of us would say that they've saved our lives in a, in a, in a way, um, in a very real way. And to balance that, my um, dad was visiting my relatives recently, and the usual political uh, conversation arose at the dinner table, and my dad got up, and he went over, and he laid down by the dog, and that was his protest. <laughs> um, and it's not like we can't talk about these things, but often you know when they'll go somewhere, and often you know when they won't. And I've gone into those uh, same circles with people who have different political views than I might. And what you find is there's a beauty in that when you encounter someone like that, where you are on different sides of a certain line, what you can and have to talk about to avoid things getting quite difficult quite quickly is what matters, the spiritual side. And to lean into that, um, when I go and meet with my you know, Christian relatives, um, what we talk about is their faith and the goodness they have in their communities. And there's a chance to touch someone's heart and to use the Four Noble Truths as a framework for conversation. Most of you will know the, the truths to, the first is um, the fact of dukkha, suffering, and to comprehend it is the task. To let go of its source, craving, tanha, is the second. To realize peace, cessation, is the third. And fourth is to develop the path. So there's a real curiosity and almost a game. Can you find someone's dharma language? Can you touch their four noble truths? Can you touch their first? Where is their suffering? Where is their love? You know, and sometimes you find that through talking about their favorite NFL team. You know, you never know. But can that be the task? Is how can you make your way to someone's truths? And that overlay of the Four Noble Truths breaks down all barriers. This is where our shared humanity comes to bear. And ironically, this is also where real change in communication occurs, is that where the standard uh, political back and forth might manifest and go nowhere, when you talk to someone and touch their heart, when you learn what matters to them, when you ask them questions, it's very common to find nice people. It's very hard to find curious people. People want to tell their stories. They want to be seen. So when you approach someone like that, then you know maybe there is a chance for some seed to be planted, um, which does change their view over time. But there's been an empathetic bridge formed, and that's the prerequisite. The analogies in Buddhism are never or rarely these uh, analogies of twisting and contorting conditions to our will. It's often analogies of gardening, of agriculture. The word bhavana means to grow. And so instead of kind of coming to someone who disagrees with us and thinking we have to change their mind to suit us, can we instead conceive of like, okay, maybe we planted a seed or two and just trusting people's hearts that it'll grow. And to also overlay those Four Noble Truths, that higher order narrative, onto uh, the people that we dismiss. You know, if you have um, aversion towards small town America and the views that they might hold, can you trace back to the first noble truth of suffering? Can you see how a small town ripped apart by uh, jobs moving elsewhere elsewhere, and fentanyl addiction and all these things would want some measure of control and power and just some sense of control over their lives. And maybe that's not always channeled in the perfect realm, but can you understand where it comes from? If you have a problem and aversion towards the coastal elites, quote unquote, can we understand that maybe those drive towards um, certain a politics of uh, a certain kind of inclusion or other things, that many people in the cities are bereft of community and connection and love. And, you know, often a political view will be addressing some deep need in the heart. And I'm not saying either of these are right or wrong. 
I'm just saying tracing to the first noble truth is where our humanity meets, and that's where compassion hides. Going into the politics and the news cycle, also fear arises. And wondering what will happen when uh, this or that comes about, what might come to be. And I think here it's really useful to consider the refuges. And before we come to practice, often we do implicitly take refuge in external conditions. How can we keep things good enough? How can we find security? And to understand that the world is fragile and always breaking, we constantly reach into a liquid looking to grasp a solid, but that there is true refuge in the uh, practice. The Buddha said there's five kinds of loss, health, wealth, relatives, right view, and morality. And he said of the first three, uh, the first three are trivial. We will lose wealth, we will lose relatives, we will become sick. But the last two, right view and our sila, our morality, our real losses, those are the things we protect. And what you find is that when those are held sacred, that there's a fearlessness that hides there. Some of you will know uh, the book, The Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Shultzenitsyn. And it's the book probably most responsible for bringing down the Soviet Union. Uh, Shultzenitsyn was put into a Russian gulag for decades. And in his time there, he wrote this entire book in his head. That was how he occupied himself. And it was printed on secret presses after he finished and passed around in the underground of Russia, in the Soviet Union. And the rule was that you had to read it in, I think, a day or maybe two days before you passed it to the next person so that it wouldn't be stopped. And it laid open what was the brutality underneath the surface. It's a pretty depressing book. But except for the tales of those in the camps and the gulags who were untouched by every condition, he talks of a woman named Aunt Ducia Chamil, who was a faithful Christian, and she came in, and the guards, when she was entering the camp, Schultzenitzen was, you know, heard or was there, asked, what's your, what's your term? And she said, as long as God keeps me here, as long until my debt is paid. And they said, uh, silly woman, oh, okay, like you're here for 15 years. They looked at her paper. Um, but she was sincere, and Schultzenitzen says she was actually released after two and a half years for some reason. Then there's the story of Gregory Ivanovich Grigoriev, a soil scientist. And Schultzenitzen talks about this man who was just untouched by the camps. His, I think he said his honesty was monstrous. <laughs> so he was uh, an expert and was uh, offered this position you know, with people working in the quarries and breaking themselves to keep up with the work. He was offered a fairly comfortable position as the headman, recording the output of the mine. But he would be required to pad the books just a little bit, and he refused and went to crush rocks with everyone else. There, at one point, he was sent to collect potatoes with the other starving prisoners. And of course, they took some for themselves and ate um, just to keep going. But he refused. He wouldn't steal, even in that case, even to feed himself. And Schultzenitschen just talks about this man who somehow thrived in the midst of all this. His heart was untouched. There's a book called The Saint of the Prisons by Monk Mose. Uh, about Ukrainian Orthodox monks in the gulags. And the author comes into the prison after, in I think, 1959, and meets the other monks who have been there for nine years and taken it upon themselves to live out 
even that life of brutality as a chance to atone for the sins of all beings. And he says they were radiant. And I find that there's heart and refuge in that recollection that fearlessness doesn't come from hoping the city won't burn. It comes from the knowledge that if it did, you wouldn't run and do anything to survive necessarily. But what would it mean to walk straight back in and care for those dying and care for those who are sick? That's where fearlessness lies. To know that things have been bad before, the Buddha uh, and the kingdoms around him, the large kingdoms were expanding and consuming the neighboring tribes, the kingdom of Magadha, of Kosala. There was war. The commentaries say his whole clan was massacred. Um, and the Buddha walked through this and famine with utter equanimity. And this is the standard. King Ajitasattu, who was a prince of Magadha, who'd murdered his father, King Bimbisara, approaches the Buddha at one point and the Buddha doesn't chase him away. He receives him and teaches him the Dhamma. And after he's finished, King Achitasattu, overcome with guilt, says, I did wrong. I killed my father, a good man. And the Buddha says, one who acknowledges a fault and determines her strength in the future grows in the Dhamma. Angulimala, who was a murderer of many, the Buddha received and taught, and in the end ordained and redeemed. There's one monk named Venerable Puna, and he wants to go off to a rough land called Sunaparanta. And the Buddha says, um, those in Sunaparanta are rough, Venerable Puna, are you, are you ready? What if they say unkind words to you? And Venerable Puna says, I'll think, well, at least they're not hitting me with their fists. And the Buddha says, what if they hit you with their fists? And Venerable Puna says, I'll think at least they're not hitting me with sticks. And the Buddha says, what if they hit you with sticks? I think you can see where this is going. And Venerable Puna says, well, I think at least they're not killing me. And the Buddha says, what if they kill you? And he says, well, some people have to search for an assassin to get their own death at some point, but at least I don't have to search for an assassin. <laughs> and the Buddha says, you're ready to go. <laughs> Good. So this sort of equanimity, many of you will know the simile of the saw, this famous sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 21. And the Buddha says, I do not call one easy to speak to, soft to admonish, when they are easy to admonish, easy to speak to, soft of speech, uh, in times when uh, they are not subjected to disagreeable and painful speech. I only call one easy to speak to when they are easy to speak to, when they are easily admonished in harsh words. He says, others may speak to you, bhikkhus, in words that are truthful or untruthful, timely or untimely, gentle or harsh, connected with the goal and not connected with the goal, filled with loving kindness or not. And in each one of these cases, that's, that's the whole gambit, those five, in every one of these cases, one should think, my mind will re remain unaffected, and I will utter no evil words. I will abide compassionate, restrained, caring for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness. Even if, bhikkhus, a band of bandits were to saw you limb from limb with a two-handled saw, those of you who gave rise to even a moment of loving kindness, a moment of anger, would not be doing my bidding. That's the standard. So it's a high one, but I think it's really useful to keep in mind that the Buddha moved through these same realms. He moved through a politic and a political situation which was rife and unfair and corrupt. And loving kindness is always the standard. The BBC did an interview with different religious leaders and said, um, is anger ever justified? And the only leader that said anger is never justified was the Dalai Lama. Because in Buddhism, anger always taints an action. 
It's not that we can't pay attention to that voice that says this is enough, something needs to be done. But when you act from that place, it always taints it with a sliver of something else. In Buddhism, we're all about suppressing anger, not repressing anger. Repression is saying, I'm not angry, I'm fine. And that's just annoying <laughs> and fake <laughs> and not helpful. But suppression is saying, I'm not going to act on this. I'm going to wait an hour or two hours until I can act from a place of love. And action is always more powerful when undertaken from love. The Sangha, the monastics have five conditions that we have to meet before we can admonish another monastic. We have to wait for the right time. So that's important. You know, when is it before they've eaten? Are they tired? We have to speak when we're pure of fault from fault ourselves. We have to speak honestly. We have to ask permission and receive permission. And we have to speak from a mind, a mind of loving kindness. And that's a strong firewall. If you can keep to those, it's worth a great deal. Because often what it means is, yes, you have to wait five minutes until you've cooled down, or an hour, or a day. I know one monk who's waited a year <laughs> before he could speak from loving kindness. But when there's not that splinter of anger, the conversation is completely different. And it can come from this place of genuine curiosity. So can you hold up those means, those conditions for admonishment before you begin to speak and give feedback? The interesting thing is that when love is undertaken, or when actions are undertaken from love, they are potentized in such a way. Some of you will know um, the story of the appeal to the government in the wake of the AIDS pandemic sweeping through the US in the late 80s. And there were many angry protests and then there was one thing that wasn't a protest, but a vigil. And the distinction between those two words is important. And it was the mothers of those who died making quilts of the lives and the hearts of their sons and their daughters who died from AIDS and laying them out side by side in Washington, DC. I think the first display was nearly 2,000 panels. And it gathered momentum and eventually, you know, I think they had roughly as thousands and thousands of panels collected over decades. That was the timeless protest. That was the vigil. So what's the difference between a vigil fueled and motivated by love versus a protest which is in anger? What's the difference there? And it's very interesting to look back at the headlines of 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and just feel their brittleness, feel how they lack that timeless element until you touch into those few political actors which were at their heart spiritual. We can undertake political action, but can it come from a place of spirit at its basis? This is why we remember Desmond Tutu. This is why we remember Nelson Mandela. They acted in the world, but their heart was always grounded in love. And it's very interesting to go back to headlines in the 1990s and some rant um, you remember about the defense you know, minister and just feel the brittleness of it. How you're like, what was that about? Why did I get so angry? Was it worth it? It's like seeing plastic faded in sun. And do you really want to give your heart over to that? It's not that we can't make a difference, but can we be grounded first and foremost in love? Because that is what make, makes a difference. And if that means pulling back a bit from the news, it's OK. And to recollect also that when we do this, ironically, it's the missing ingredient in a society that's truly integrated and able to change. Ideologies are crippled religions. They limp along. 
They provide a modicum of purpose and cohesion and sense of community, but they lack any of the richness or breadth of a true spiritual narrative. And there's something in the human heart which needs a spiritual narrative. We need that framework. How do we confront suffering? How do we confront suffering? How do we purify our hearts? Because something in us knows we are meant for more than a well-adjusted middle-class life. Something in us knows awakening a complete selfless purity is the correct orientation. And Buddhism and the Four Noble Truths and meditation give us that framework. It is the most, it is the highest order story we could possibly get. The Four Noble Truths hold everything. And if people don't have that, then those religious impulses are projected onto this and that, and each projection is unworthy. And this is where so much of the polarization comes from, is people projecting, you know, in much of America, our spiritual canopy is in shreds. And so ideologies and movements, which are at their heart motivated by something good, are imbued with a fanaticism and a polarization which kind of deranges them. And this is much of the, I think, reason for the p current political difficulty. So if you bring to those around you a real spiritual narrative, if you speak about the Four Noble Truths, if you touch their hearts, if you talk about practice, it's an inoculation. If we can provide, again, a spiritual canopy of meaning that's accessible and inclusive and caring, then the worst excesses of our culture and of the culture wars disappear and fade. And there can be a genuine communication between sides and integration. So when you lean into this practice, when you care for your heart, when you speak to those at the dinner table carefully about something which, which you can actually talk about in a set with compassion, it's not shirking your duty as a citizen. It's addressing a root cause of so much of the discontent. So just to hold this, that we come into this lineage of teaching, of spiritual path, and what a gift, and what a duty, and what an opportunity to care for a world and people that need care. And maybe that does mean that we uh, unsubscribe from at least some of those political podcasts and listen to some Dharma talks instead. So, Sadhu, good luck. Sadhu, 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 Anumodami. Okay, we have a chance for questions or discussion. People can raise their hand and Damien, our new mic runner, will get the mic to you. Or if you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand. Um, and just a caveat, because I always need to do it like three times. I'm not saying you shouldn't vote or do things politically. It's okay. Just keep your heart in the right place during it. Okay. You have to kind of hold it down a little until it goes green. Hello, thank you. This is unrelated to your Dharma talk, but how do you recommend dealing with disturbing noises, say, from my neighbors in the apartment? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I think that um, Longpur Cha used to reflect he was uh, sitting, trying to sit meditation. There was a fair at the nearby village, and Initially, he tried to stuff beeswax in his ears, but which actually you can try, uh, except maybe just normal earplugs um, or noise canceling headphones, actually. But uh, in the absence of that, he reflected that um, why 
am I going out and bothering the, no the noise? The noise is just doing what the noise does. It makes noise. It's you who are bothering the noise, not the noise that's bothering you. Um, which is a really nice reflection, and if it works, that's great. Um, I'd say that's, you know, really one of the ways, uh, another way is to expand awareness to kind of hold the noise within its scope. So instead of having kind of this tight object trying to hold uh, integrated despite noise coming and impacting it, just imagine the mind holding the noise as well. That can kind of help. Um, but I'd also say that, you know, looking at the aversion is worth a lot, trying to sit through it and seeing how that works. Sometimes it takes a while. But we can sit through distracting sound. I uh, had a monk, one of my monastery, uh, the monastery I was at, who would spontaneously just yell very loudly. And, you know, after a while, it's, it's all kind of held in good humor, you know? The world does what the world does. Like, you know, and then you come back to the U.S. and people are getting angry at the person next to them for breathing loudly. And you're just like, you have, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so you can meditate through a lot. Um, but also, like, it's fine to put in, I use earplugs sometimes, and that's just fine. Um, yeah. That help at all. I, this noise is an issue. It is. Yeah, I think I try to be extra mindful in those moments, and I try to center myself, and it just feels particularly agitating. You can, so you can what really, I, oh, sorry. What I'm hearing is just to keep going, basically. Partly, yes. And, and you know, experiment with skillful means, like try making the sound an object um, in and of itself a little bit. Just center around it, imagine. Spread it loving kindness. Um, you know, uh, but at some level, you know, you can only do so many different things with it until sometimes you just have to put in earplugs. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Actually, uh, yeah, kind of building on that last question. Um, so when I read about or experiment with meditation, I, I feel like I'm, I come across two different schools of thought, I guess, like one um, where you're concentrating very deeply on like one particular object, right, like, like the breath. And then the other school that kind of says any object is really fine and like um, just, I guess, the awareness is important or, or, or how you are being aware. Mm -hmm. And I just uh, was wondering if you could talk to kind of, I guess, in your experience, like when you find which way appropriate and, and you know, what's a skillful uh, way to practice. Yeah, it's a really good point, or a really good question. One of the difficulties with how meditation has always been framed back and forth, I think, is we've either focused on spotlight awareness, which is where you take one object and steer awareness completely to it, like the breath at the tip of the nose, and then lantern awareness, which is like whatever comes into awareness is, is okay. Um, and both have their place, like a focused awareness can really ground and anchor you. A broad awareness, especially if the mind's centered enough to not get drawn off, can be very powerful. And some of you will know noting method, which is where you note objects that arise, like hearing, hearing, annoying sound, annoying sound, um, and just noting whatever comes through awareness. There's a psychologist who uh, in MRIs, they found a third sort of awareness that interacts or manifests in the brain in a completely different way, and that's play awareness, playfulness. It, it has a completely different read in the brain scans, and I like that because play awareness allows both the, it allows you to experiment with both and see which one works. For you know, the, the classic overlay that Buddhist thought gives is you use one point to kind of anchor awareness, and we call that samatha, or tranquility practice. So say, putting awareness on a point of the breath. And once the mind is sort of settled enough, then you open and develop insight, which is where you can sort of watch mental objects arise and fade, and you're centered enough that you don't get drawn away. Um, that's a useful framework, 
but I find it's also a bit overly simple because many moderns and Westerners, we have these very active thinking minds. And in the ancient teachings, you come across a lot of focus on finding one point or one meditation word and just going at it for a few decades until you achieve a profound state of concentration. And it just doesn't work for a lot of moderns. And so acknowledging that it's helpful to kind of Samadhi can be translated better, perhaps, as unification of mind. And that there's a, um, what that means is that if you, or singleness of purpose. And what that means is that if you do something like we did in the meditation to begin with, which is where you um, move awareness around the body, um, because you're remaining within that satipatthana, that mind, that foundation of mindfulness of the body, over time, even though you might find the mind focuses on one point, but then it might oscillate and expand to feel the whole body, and they might go back and forth until they kind of merge. And one point can either be one point on the floor or the whole floor. And similarly, when you achieve one-pointed concentration, um, some people get there through a wide awareness by continually expanding awareness to encompass the whole field of the body or imagining the breath as the whole body. But some people, and perhaps the majority, get there through coming to one point, and then suddenly that point after time begins to evolve to be the whole body, and they kind of merge, but it's a unification. So all to say that single-pointed versus wide tend to merge, um, but then also to acknowledge that if there's a very stubborn hindrance that keeps coming up, there's a place for kind of being aware of it and naming it and getting to put it down like that. Or if the mind's very calm, then uh, you can watch that stuff arise and not get drawn in. But if you find you're not anchored enough and you get drawn away and start fantasizing, then you know you should come back to your, your normal practice, your samatha practice. So this is samatha and vipassana, tranquility and insight. Did that help at all?